Today, we're going to follow up with our series message of Supernatural. But instead of talking on Supernatural life, I want to talk about the intense life, the intense life that the Lord has for us. Years ago, I shared from the pulpit that um, I became fearless. This, uh, I, I don't know the craziness that came to my mind, but I said that after a, a recent tragedy in my family. So I decided to say that from the pulpit, that I became fearless. So a brother invited me to his um, training or his uh, study uh, how to fly. So he invited me to be part of one of his flying lessons. I was in the Pagefield Airport and I saw the one engine uh, aircraft you're going to have his fly uh, class. His instructor was 83 years old. It took him about one hour just to prepare the whole thing and have his strength enough to go inside of the aircraft. So the test of my fearlessness was real that day. And for my surprise, uh, the instructor, he let my friend pilot the aircraft most of the time. So I was extremely dizzy in the very back of the aircraft. So I tried to distract myself. And my friend said, this is my first time I'm piloting. Like I'm actually taking the, I don't know how the name of the, the wheel thing. Like how they, what is the name of the aircraft equipment that controls the airplane. And he joked that he wanted my company exactly because he was not sure if he would survive after that class. So he wanted to make sure that the pastor was with him in case he needed prayer in the middle of the air. Yeah, I, I shouldn't say that, that I was fearless because that made my life a lot intense that day. And that's the problem when we think that intensity is only to have high adrenaline levels all the time. No, intensity means live your life in full. Have the fullness of God's joy. And that's my goal this morning. That by the word of God, you can be inspired to not live a mediocre, just an ordinary, just passing by this existence. But you're really making your life worth. And the only way you're going to do that is if you understand God's word and principles. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Let's pray together. Father, I pray for revelation. Your word brings together power. Your word brings together life. When you speak, you speak spirit and life. And I pray that as we share this message this morning, Father, Families may receive a new measure of life. Anointing flows in this place. Resurrecting the dead. Lifting up the defeated one. Awakening the dormant. I pray in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Are you guys ready for the word of God? Amen. Praise God. Mario, that door needs to be shut. All the other doors can be opened. Just that one needs to be closed. Yeah, because that's the only one that goes our air out. Amen. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4 to 7. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. And raised us up with him. And seated us with him in the heavenly places. In Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. My sons, 
they went to their school homecoming party. And after the party, they never heard before the expression after party party. And they were wondering what was that. And then my wife said, that's when actually they start the party. Because under the school supervision, they probably going to do all the craziness they are planning to. So after the party yesterday, a brother told me, Pastor, are you sure you're going to have meeting tomorrow morning? I said, this is our after party. We live life intensely. We live our life in full. We're not saving up some life for use in the future. We live it here and now with all that the Lord has for us. He has riches. He has life and resurrected life. Not only life, but resurrected life. It's supernatural life. The Bible says that the measure of life we have is immeasurable according to His grace and kindness. So when you look to your life, do you wish to be someone else? Or you are extremely satisfied, enjoying, and happy with the life you are living now? Do you consider the privilege of being a child of God? Or are you still comparing yourself through social media, wishing if you could have someone else's life? So my wife was commenting with me after we talked to so many people that are unchurched people visiting us, how different it is to communicate with a person that never experienced the grace of God. How that person sees the life that she or he is having. How they see their own family. Like they don't see the beauty of raising a child. They don't have enjoyment in their marriage. They are just living day by day, expecting more worries for tomorrow. They can see the joy of having a family. And they are fast to compare and easy to complain. But there's so much life available for us that is, in the words of the apostle, immeasurable. We don't need to wait, wait until the moment when we're going to finally get rich. We're going to have enough to spare. We are called to live intensely now. Luke chapter 12, verse 22. And he said to the disciples, Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. If there is a drain, if there is a faucet, sink, or bathtub drain that sucks life out of you is anxiety, is worrisome, is preoccupation. You are occupying your present with a prediction of bad things for tomorrow. So instead of living your present, you are worried for tomorrow. And if not for the tomorrow, you are condemned of your past. And that's why you are still projecting a horrible future for tomorrow. But Jesus says, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. You're not supposed to be preoccupied of what you're going to eat or what you're going to dress, nor about your body, what you're going to put on. Verse 23, for life is more than food. Life is more. Anyone repeat with me? Say, life is more. Life is more than buying. Life is more than just waking up, take your breakfast, going home very tired and expecting the next day the same toil. Life is more. It's more than eat or drink or dressing or buying. Life is more. Would you say this again? Life is more. Is your life more? Has been your life more or just again? Is your life again? It's just your life, ordinary life, more significant, more relevant. Life is more. So this envy culture that just project an appearance that we must fit in, that we just have what everybody else is having, this enormous mansion that some of you guys even work inside, Brings to us the idea that this is life. When I finally going to have that thing, that house, that car, I will finally live life intensely. But maybe you don't know, inside of that house, there is a depressed woman with 
suicidal thoughts or a drug abuser, young, losing his life, also thinking of killing himself. Maybe a man that after a betrayal is now with this consuming thoughts of depression in comparison, brokenness. So a sister told me that if it was not immoral for her as a church goer, she would bet on lottery because she would finally have enough to enjoy life. She said, Pastor, I think I will never be sad again if I'll get the lottery. She doesn't know that actually if she won the lottery, she's going to have the largest speed to bury herself into. Like everybody know the myth. That when you get this, money out of nowhere is destructive. The place where people live, the clothing that people dress, the food that apparently they are posting social media does not speak of their ultimate reality. There are so many out there passing by life. They don't know how it is to live life here and now. And this is my first principle, the principle of enjoying your present. And as the very name says, it is a gift. It is a present given by God. Your future is not called present. Your past is not called present. But the gift of God is called present. Is anybody getting my English idea here? Unless you see your present as a gift, as a present, you're going to be always dreaming the next Christmas Eve. It is God's will that we live here and now. We sang the song expecting God's move here and now. Came here today, but your mind is somewhere else. If you are worried about tomorrow or condemned about your past, The devil is literally fulfilling his design. I came, the devil says, to kill, steal, and destroy. Keeping you either in the worries of tomorrow or the condemnations of the past. But because the actual time to live is now, the devil wants to steal your present, steal your gift. There are so many trying to live life using a telescope, predicting bad things in the future, or driving their lives with eyes on the rear view mirror, never looking forward to the present. Well, what is now? Years ago, I had a terrible accident. I was driving a long type, Florida type straight line that is endless. You know what I'm talking about, right? I could just drive and you're not driving, you're just... You know, holding the steering wheel. You're not driving. Like, your mind is somewhere else. So I I was looking way ahead in that, you know, infinite straight line. And in the present, I didn't notice, but I was steering. I was bending my car toward the right side where there's a lot of cones. So the sister that was behind me, uh, because she noticed I was way ahead, not in the present, she screamed in my ear saying, Pastor, the cones! And I reacted as a motorcyclist, not as a car driver. I actually pulled the steer wheel and I um, flipped the car two times in the middle of the road. That's what happens of those that are not living the present now. They're going to incur in terrible accidents, tragedies, because they are only look forward or they are just distracted with the condemnations of the rear view mirror. Romans chapter 8 verse 1 is the pill to solve the sickness of condemnation. The Bible says, there is therefore now, not tomorrow, not yesterday, but now. And this now works today. And believe me, when you open your Bible tomorrow in Romans chapter 8, the word now will be dead again because now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Yeah, that deserves a good shout of praise in this house because if you're still lock yourself in the past, there is no way to live intense life. And for the ones 
that are still struggling to believe that God has good plans for you. You need to remember the words of the prophet Jeremiah that I love so much that says, God saying, I know, I know the plans I have for you. You don't need to plan. You don't need to worry. I know the plans I have for you. Plans for welfare. I'm conspiring. I'm working things together. I'm arranging people and circumstances at your favor. I know what are the plans and they are plans of welfare and not for evil. To give you a future in hope. Say with me, hope. Hope is more than just positive thinking. Hope is knowing that God have a plan and is a good plan for tomorrow. Verse 12, then you call upon me and come and pray to me and I will hear you. A big problem of an un answer prayer is that you are worried. You are only praying out of worry and not praying out of hope. I'll repeat that. That deserves a Twitter. You are not receiving your prayers answer yet because you're only being fueled. You're only being motivated by your worries of tomorrow, condemnations of the past, while you should be praying out of hope. Your hope is the few, is the basis, is the raw material of your faith. Hebrews chapter 11 says that faith is the certainty, the assurance of things hope for. How are you going to receive anything from God without faith? And how are you going to have faith without hope? Expectation that sustains that faith, that conviction. Luke chapter 21 verse 34. Watch yourself. Lest your hearts be weighted down with dissipation and drunkness. Say drunkness. Yes, dissipation and drunkness. Of what? Of the cares of this life in that day come upon you suddenly like a trap. I'm not afraid of the return of Christ. I'm expecting of the return of Christ. It is from one glory to another degree of glory until the final glory of my glorification. My body transformed in a blink of an eye and I'll be before my Lord with joy being not in my own righteousness, but believing in the righteousness of Christ. I am in Him, found in Him. Anxiety is the result of the worries, of the possible frustration of my personal plans for the future. So what about I give my plans for the future in the one that knows everything? And that's why we should stay in peace. Stay in the constant mood of peace. I may be physically tired. I may be even like emotionally exhausted because I had to make decisions all the time. But my constant mood is peace. Say amen, everybody. I may be frustrated because someone contradicted me. I may be a little bit disappointed because things were not like I planned. But my constant inner mood is peace. And I go back to that place when I need resources to deal with my emotional distress. Matthew 2, 11 verse 28 says, Come to me, all who labor. Okay, so this is not a conversation for the lazy one. I know I'm speaking to the ones that are laboring. I'm, I, I hope I'm speaking to the one that dis, decided to not be a lazy couch potato teenager. I'm speaking to you that already labor. But you that labor, careful, do not let your labor become a dissipation and drunkenness. But as you labor, come to Him and receive from Him the rest. You that have a heavy laden. Who labor doesn't need to have a heavy laden burden. We can labor and work, but not necessarily be dragged and tired of some, exhausted. Because the Lord give us rest. Take my yoke upon you. And learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. This is the picture. So the yoke of uh, bulls. Okay. Usually when you want to train the wild, untamed 
young bull. You're going to yoke him or it. I don't know how to say about a bull. Him, it. Yeah, bull. You're going to yoke the bull, young one, with an experienced, gentle, listen, tamed bull. And those two cattle, these two bulls, they will work together. Now listen, in the end of the day, young and strong ended up exhausted because they waste energy. But the gentle and tamed Lamb of God, the sacrificial bull, Jesus Christ, he took all the weight upon his shoulders. And now I just enter in his labor. I enter in his rest. Jesus says in verse 30, For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So first, peace is received. Is received because we are justified. Is received because there is no condemnation now for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans 5 verse 1. I receive peace before God because I am justified. We have peace with God. Because I have been justified by faith through our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 2. Through him we have also obtained access by faith. Into his grace, into his resources, favor. I'm not only in peace, but I'm also prosperous, resourced. I have more than enough in which we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. So first, peace is received passively by faith. But the second aspect of peace is I grow by striving. By making all the effort. And if you look in your, in your New Testament, there are very few moments that you're going to see the apostles uh, uh, making an appeal for your effort, for your participation. And one of them is here in Hebrews chapter 3 that says, So we see that they were unable, the people of Israel were unable to enter the rest because of their unbelief. Like I said, we receive peace by faith. And then verse 1 of chapter 4 says, Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear, let us, lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. So a second aspect is peace is reached and it is kept. Verse 11 says, Let us therefore strive to enter that rest. I'll say, let us strive to stay in that rest, in that state of peace, so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. Which disobedience? Unbelief. Unbelief. That is an exercise of constantly reminding your soul of this truth. If my past, listen careful, is forgotten, my future is guaranteed. That's another tweeter. If my past is forgotten, I don't need to worry about my future. Say amen in this house. And that's what keeps us there in the place of peace. Um, we should be, like my wife told me that they announced prematurely to our VCA kids, Vine Christian Academy kids, that the firefighters will visit them. And the teachers barely could teach in the coming weeks. Why? Because every single day, for at least a hundred times, the kids will ask, is it today? The firefighters are going to come today. And finally, the firefighters came. They took pictures and all. And they learned the lesson. They only announced the trunk or treat two days or one day before the trunk or treat. Because it would be unbearable to teach those kids. Why? Because as a child, we also should have an expectation of a party tomorrow. There is a birthday party coming tomorrow. Tomorrow is what God is preparing for me and his good plans. 
People of the world say we should not have expectations because we're going to end it up frustrated. We're going to end it up disappointed. But the Lord invite us to have hope and great expectation. There is no way we're going to live a life that is intense, that is worth, unless we have good expectations. We call this hope. We are not sustaining our hope just in positive thinking. It's not just my positive thoughts. When people in the world listen to these positive YouTube short videos, when we see people looking for all these personal coach and these encouragement speeches out there, they are looking for encouragement. But in the end of the day, their conscience, listen, their self-awareness will ask them, why I'm deceiving myself? Why do you think good things are going to take place in my life just because I wish? Like, it doesn't make any sense. But us sustain. We have an anchor on our soul that even though, listen, our boat may shake. Even though the waves may be very wild, the wind may blow and strong, my anchor holds me together. The boat is steady in the same place. Which place? The place of peace and growing hope. And that's why it's so important to give up, to abandon the self-merit principle. The, the idea that you deserve anything in yourself. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. That though he was rich, yet for your sake, he became poor. So that you, by his poverty, might become rich. Say amen, everybody. I don't know if you like this verse, but I love to hear this verse. That says that the Lord has riches in store for me. There was a great exchange on the Calvary. For the believer, we live based on what Christ deserves. It's not about what I deserve. It's not about my worthiness, my merit. It's about what Christ deserves. The true good news is not going to come from my company, growth, my family, inheritance, uh, promise. It comes from the fact that Christ took my place so now I can take his place of deserving blessings. Not in myself. Salvation, eternal life, abundance of life have to be by grace alone. And why? Because it's so expensive that it will never be able to pay. And God is so rich that he will never sell it to you. He doesn't need to. He sent Christ Jesus as our representative. Now listen, I, I visit the, the castles of the British crown family, the, um, the royal family in, in England. And they have two major castles, the, the Buckingham and the one in the countryside. I forgot the name. And they have these pictures and these assets that actually became a collection. It's called the royal collection. And if England, by any chance, the uh, British pound gets devalued, just their collection is able to bring British back on their own feet easily. They don't need to back up the pound value in gold or anything else. Just based on the historicity of the royal family objects and collections. It's like unbelievable, the price. I don't know the numbers, but like it's, it's above your mind can measure. And most of those objects has to do with a specific artist or even sometimes a member of the royal family that built, that uh, made a sculpture, that painted that specific canvas or artwork. Now listen, God will never sell us what was made by the hands of his son, ever. God will never put a price that we're going to have any human being capable of paying. That's why it has to be 
by grace. And this is the truth. Romans chapter 5 verse 17. Because if one man trespasses, death reign through that one man, Adam, much more will those, much more, much more, those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through one man, Jesus Christ. The Bible speaks about the principle of representatives so many times. So the offerer, the giver, will come before the priest to offer God a sacrifice and to give God worship. The priest will make a inspection. He's going to look to the offerer. He's going to look to the lamb being offered. He was going to look to the offerer, the giver, and think his hair is not appropriately. His clothing is not correct. It seemed that he had a discussion with his wife. I don't know if he's a good father. Maybe he's not raising his children appropriately. I don't think he prayed enough. And then he's going to look to the lamb. And the lamb was blameless. No spots. Perfect. Then the priest is going to say, you are going to lay your hands on the lamb. And all your defects, all your blemish will pass to the lamb, to the sacrifice. We're going to sacrifice and kill the lamb. I'm going to sprinkle, literally throw a little bit of uh, droplets of blood in you. And the offerer, the giver, will leave the place justified. Listen, whatever the offerer, the giver, came did not influence at all his acceptance. Only the lamb was inspected. And the lamb of God that takes the sin of the world passed the inspection. And now his blood is upon you. So you can live every single day expecting good. Because the Lord accepted Christ and all his blessings are waiting for you tomorrow. Yeah. And that's why 1 Peter, and some of you guys already received the homework to meditate in 1 Peter, says in chapter 3 verse 10, For whoever desires to love, desires to love life. Question, do you love your life? Do you enjoy waking up or you're waiting the next time you're going to sleep? I know there's a lot of people. They're so tired. They, the only thing they want is to sleep now. Parents in the room, little babies, I understand you. But in the end of the day, when you wake up and see that chubby, beautiful, cute smile, you're so thankful, right? No matter how many nights you have lost, the crying was extremely hard to endure during the night. The smile broke your heart again and conquered you. Whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. When you get frustrated, when someone went against you and contradict you, the truth is we can still can choose Love life. Love life again. It's when we decide to laugh more about the upsets and oppositions. When we get the frustration, the immediate frustrations, as, listen, blessings with interest. God is only accumulating interests in your blessings. He's just saving up for a big surprise tomorrow. So I can choose to love life. When Peter wrote this uh, verse in 1 Peter chapter 3, he was quoting Psalm 34. So I decided to put for you guys the amplified version of this block of verses that Peter is quoting and somehow even changing some of the words to give more meaning for us in the New Testament. He says, the one who wants to enjoy life and see 
good days. Good, whether apparent or not. Must keep his stone from free from evil. Why complain when you can worship? Why you decided to compare when you could praise God? Free from evil. And his lips from speaking guile, treachery, deceit. Why comparison? You don't need that. Praise God for what you have now. And as you develop gratitude, and when you praise what the Lord is giving you, what you have will be overflowed. Pastor, I don't have enough in my marriage. Thank God for what you have now, and the Lord is going to supply even more. Why God is a good father? Listen, we're going to give you more of the things you are complaining of. Why God is going to give you more of the things that you don't like? So he actually may be able to take even away because you complain about it. And as a good father, he doesn't want to make you get away. Unfortunately, so many people learn gratitude only when there is loss. When they notice they had it and now by a tragedy, by a circumstance of life, they lost. Verse 11, he must turn away from wickedness and do what is right. He must search for peace with God, peace with self, peace with others, and pursue it eager, eagerly, actively, not merely desiring it. Verse 12, for the eyes of the Lord are looking favorably upon the righteous. How many of in this house here is righteous before, Christ, before the Lord in Christ Jesus? How many of you guys are righteous in this place? Come on, let me see your hand. There you go. The Lord looks favorably upon you and his ears are attentive to their prayers, eager to answer. I love that. The Lord is just waiting to hear your prayer. Just tell me. I want to hear you, son. I want to surprise you. Look, you say, Pastor, but if God already knows why he doesn't give me. Because how you're going to know is from the Lord unless you pray for it. You may think it's out of your own self-righteousness, your hard work, the good break and your influence. Maybe it's because I'm good looking. <laughs> and maybe you are thinking more than you need to about yourself. But the face of the Lord is against those who practice evil. What evil? Arrogance. What evil? Ungratefulness. What evil? Complaint. Comparison. Praise God for everything and your life will be much more enjoyable. Unless we le learn to bless, we're going to start to get familiar with the things around us. And when we get familiar with the church, with the pastor, with the message you receive, we start to devalue, dismiss, put it aside. We don't see the need to get earlier because we got familiar. Look this Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 27, verse 7. Very strong. It says, one, he's one who is full loathes honey. In other words, you got so much honey. You got so much sugar. That you became satisfied and familiar. But the one who is hungry, everything bitter is sweet. Value the food God is giving you. Value the church the Lord is giving you. Value the spiritual food the Lord is giving you. Value the wife, the spouse, the husband God is giving you. Someone said... If the moon and stars appeared once a year, the whole world would have a holiday to gaze at the sky at the night. I don't know if you noticed the full moon we had yesterday, but we didn't need any sun in that night yesterday, right? Like no sunlight. We needed just the moonlight. What a beautiful night. First Peter chapter 2, verse 1 to 3. And I'll close with this. So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants, long for pure spiritual milk, 
that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Would you guys stand on your feet this morning? Come on. And if you had received from the Lord, I want you right now, just agree with me in prayer. Because once again, Peter is quoting another psalm. Psalm 34, one of our favorite psalms that says, taste and see, taste and see. It is, it is a dare. It is a challenge. It is more than an invitation. You must taste flavor and see how good and experience how good the Lord is. Bless is the man who takes refuge in him. Some of you lost life drive, life stamina. Life is not intense anymore. You're just waiting another Monday tomorrow. But what if the Lord is preparing a blessing, a breakthrough? What if the Lord is planning good things for you? What if 1 Peter chapter 3 is a reality for you? His ears are attentive to your prayers. His ears are eager to answer your prayer. What do you pray for tomorrow? If you know that the Lord is listening now and He is willing to make your life intense again. Close your eyes. And I dare you to pray bold prayers again. I dare you to taste and see that the Lord is good again. Amen.